And if you're a visitor and didn't know to do that, uh, just feel free to get up and go get one, or we can bring one to you, because we will be celebrating communion at the end of our service, all right? So let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks and praise for the truth of your word. We want it to be a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, so that we might hide your word in our hearts to become more like the person of Jesus Christ, to take on his character, to be our character. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're in this series called God in Unexpected Places, and last week and today and then in two weeks, because next week is Mother's Day, and I'll do a little Mother's Day sermon in between, we're looking at uh, Jesus in unexpected places and the unexpected things he said. Jesus was one of these uh, folks in his day that he never said things or did things the way the people thought he would. And the, and the point is, all of us have ideas about God. You do, I do, everyone on the street has ideas about God and how he's supposed to be and what he's supposed to do for us and if we do this and we're supposed to get blessed from him. But when we look at Jesus in the scriptures, he is not who we often think he is. He had a habit of doing what everybody thought he should do, he wouldn't do it. He often shocked the non-religious, he scandalized the religious, he left many people wondering, who is this man? So they could either hold on to their own view of who Jesus was, or they could try to redefine Jesus into the, who they thought he should be, or they could accept him. And what we're looking at in this series called God in Unexpected Places is that we have the same choice. And if the Jesus you encounter in the Bible Okay? It's not like who you think he should be. What are you going to do? I mean, you've got few options. You can either reject the Jesus of Scripture, or you can redefine him in your own image of who you think he should be, or you can accept who Scripture says that he is. So you've just got very few choices that you can do here. Either you can deny him, you can redefine him, or you can accept him. Because if you walk out on the street, everyone has an opinion about God and about Jesus. I looked for a video uh, called Word on the Street. I use, often use those here. And they're, the ones I found were like eight, nine, ten minutes long. But then I remember that this past Wednesday night, Audrey Lane showed one to her Bible study group uh, called the State of Theology, where these people go out and just ask, who is Jesus to you? Who is God to you? Watch this. Believe there is a God? Yes, I do. I believe in a creator of sorts. Um, God is just one name. I don't necessarily believe in God. I believe in a higher being, I guess. What do you believe about? I believe that, that he's there to take care of us and here to help us. And if not that in your life, you're not going to go very far. Whatever, whatever it is has a lot of control over us in our lives. I don't really know. <laughs> There's too much stuff in this world that we just can't know. God is the supreme creator. To me, it's probably someone that uh, look to for advice and guidance mostly. Have you ever read the Bible? Um, I took a Bible as literature class in college, but that's about as far as I got into it. Do you read the Bible? Uh, no, I don't. I, uh, I'm skeptical of organized religions run by men. It was written a very, very long time ago, so the wording in some parts of it can be taken out of context because, of course, the context is way different now. People have did some changes in it, you know what I mean? But the word, I still think it's fine. Well, I believe that the Bible is God's word and it's perfect. The overarching messages that it sends are good and that's those are the things that can be taken away from it. So do you believe that there's a heaven? I'm not 100% sure on that one. I, I, I would hope, I would hope so. I try to live my life in such a way that, you know, if there is a judgment and afterlife and whatnot, they're gonna look positively on me. I believe if you do the, 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 the commandments as best you can, just do the very best you can and try, put the effort forward, then you'll have an afterlife. Until you get there, you, you won't know, right? That's the, that's a part of it. How would you define what sin is? Do you believe there is such a thing as sin? Yeah, I think, you know, things that harm the people around you for your own benefit are sinful, you know? There's no hierarchy of bad or, bad or wrong to me. It's all wrong. But by the same token, she doesn't let you be judged because we're all fallible. I don't think by nature man is sinful, and this is just me. I'm not too familiar ex with exactly what the Bible says about sin, to be perfectly honest with you. But I don't think by nature 
man is sinful? I, I would, yeah, so I would say no, basically, to that question. Okay. If you have the answer, <laughs> I would like to know. Everybody has an opinion about God. Everybody does. The question is, does that opinion align with what Scripture says, who God is, who Jesus is, what sin is in our life, okay? And so bottom line to all of this that you just saw on the screen is this. What is your authority for who Jesus is? What is your authority that you base is the way that you get into heaven? What is your authority? Is it your own opinion? Is it a mixture of your opinion and scripture? What is your authority for who Jesus is? All of my life I have struggled with God and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and their roles in my life and what does the scripture say? And then when you find yourself in a crisis, how does that crisis affect your view of God and who he is in life? Because we're often led to believe that we do all the right things, we say all the right prayers, we tithe, we go to church, God's going to take care of us. He's going to bless us. And when I look at Scripture, though, and compare it to what I see in real life, I often see two extremes of Christians. I see one called the legalistic Christian, and I see another called the liberal Christian. And then there's this group in the middle. And when I look at legalistic Christians, okay, they have a totally different view of God than the liberal Christians do. And some of these folks... You can accept God lock, stock, and barrel for Scripture says, or you can pick and choose, as you heard on the screen today, people's view of who God is. And Jesus' issue with the religious leaders of his day is that they took a legalistic view of who God is and was. And this is what made him so angry. You see, legalistic Christians, people who claim to be Christians, but they're legalistic with their faith, are often very judgmental. They're often very condemning. And they're often very self-righteous. Because you see, legalism makes you arrogant. It makes you self-conceited. Legalistic Christians have very little or no mercy or grace or forgiveness or compassion to other people who do not live in the same kind of lifestyle that they themselves live. Legalistic Christians are very quick to point out the sins and faults and failures, uh, habits and addictions of others. But you will rarely, probably never hear a legalistic Christian admit to their own. They just don't. In fact, when we read in the book of James, in James 5, 16, this, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous man, a righteous person, has great power and produces wonderful results. You will never hear a legalistic Christian doing that. They're not going to share with you what their sins and faults are, but you're going to learn from them the faults and sins and failures of others. I, I call these legalistic Christians, they use what I call the compare and contrast method that leads them to condemn others. Another way I put this for those of you who like music, I'm dating myself here, they live, legalistic Christians live by what I call the ACDC theology. Remember that rock group, ACDC? They came out with a song called Highway to Hell. Legalistic Christians look at everybody else who does not follow their view, and you're just on a highway to hell. And that's the way they live. Now, when you compare them to liberal Christians who go to the other extreme, they take a totally different view of this. Not only is there unlimited grace and unlimited love and un unlimited forgiveness and mercy and compassion, in their view, very little is sinful. Remember the guy said, I, I don't think, we're inherently sinful, okay? I mean, they're full of the love, they're full of the compassion, but they really don't see too many things that are wrong. And as a result of that, they have a wide berth of grace and forgiveness for other people, okay? And they basically internalize, they basically justify, they basically rationalize their own sin and shortcomings and failures. They'll just say to you, well, that's who I am, warts and all. God is not a God who is judgmental and sends very good people to hell. That's a liberal approach to Christianity. And, they, and liberal Christians live by what I call the Beatles theology. All you need is love. And that's the two extremes here, okay? And you will never hear liberal Christians quoting what David said in 2 Samuel 12, 13, I have sinned against the Lord. Because in their view, it's not so much a sin as it is a problem, a struggle, a symptom, a syndrome. And they turn to pop psychology for their answers and rather, rather than the truth of Scripture. But both extremes, liberalism and legalism, 
Neither one is correct because neither one is based on a biblical view of God. And so we come today in a text where Jesus makes, forces you to make a choice. It's an unexpected choice of who Jesus is. And today's sermon is unlike any I've ever done. I have no humor. I have no funny stories. Because the text we're going to look at is a very serious, serious text about what constitutes a genuine Christian. And it is a terrifying passage. It's a horrifying passage. I've read it many times. One of my, I, I try to use this quote about once a year. One of my favorite authors is a guy named C.S. Lewis. He was a devout atheist who set out to disprove Christianity and in the process ended up giving his life to Christ. And he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And here's what he says about Jesus. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the real, really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spithead him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He never intended to do that. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. If you don't have your Bibles, all the scriptures on your outline, all it's going to come up here on, on the screen as well. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 27 this morning. And in this passage, you're going to notice a lot of very familiar things that you already have heard and seen if you've been in church any length of time. Jesus puts things in a pair of twos. There's two gates. There's two fruits. There's two types of sheep, two types of foundations. And he pairs up these word pictures for us to teach us a lesson, teach us something very important about how do we know we're genuinely his. And in this passage, is some very terrifying things to me. They're horrifying. To think that we could live our whole life a certain way and in the end realize we're not the genuine thing. And so in the story, Jesus is talking to very religious people. They're orthodox in their faith. These are Jewish people. They do everything the Jewish law tells them to do. But in the teaching that they hear from Jesus, they hear something unexpected. It's surprising. It's shocking. It's horrifying. So follow along as I read the whole text to us, and then we'll go back and break it down. Jesus begins this way. Enter by the narrow gate. And why? He's going to compare two gates. Here comes the second gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many, meaning there's this narrow gate and there's this wide gate. And there are many, and if you could read Greek, the word is translated as many there means innumerable. There's so many you just can't count them. You lose the count. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few, meaning very few people in real life, very few people become committed, genuine Christians. Beware false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, meaning on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, Depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell up, and great was the fall of it. Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount 
with what I would call in the old days a hellfire and damnation sermon. How many of you are old enough to remember those sermons? Okay, all right, all right. We just dated ourselves. There's a young group over here going, what kind of sermons? Okay, you know, all right. But I grew up in that type of church, okay? And, and our, my preacher could, when he preached on hell as a kid, I could feel the flames. That's how wonderful he described it, okay? And Jesus gives us four shocking word pictures in this text for today. And as I told you, he puts them into twos. There's two types of gate, a narrow gate, a wide gate. Two types of fruit, good fruit, bad fruit. There's two types of houses, one built on a solid foundation, one not built on a solid foundation. There's two types of sheep, one that's genuine sheep, and another group, they look like the real thing, but they're really wolves that have been camouflaged. And all four of these word pictures show us the same thing, the difference in being a false Christian and a true Christian. And it's a warning. It's a warning that a lot of people look religious on the outside. They look like a Christian on the outside. They look like they're doing all the things they need to be doing. But one day they're going to hear these terrifying, horrifying words. You're not mine. Depart from me into everlasting fire. They think they are, but they're not. And this passage has always bothered me my whole life. I think people usually typically look at this passage as in the wrong way. They'll take this, and I've heard preachers do this, they'll take this story that Jesus tells here and talk about the two gates, and they'll assume that the people who are going through the wide gates are all the sinners on the road to hell, and the ones that are going through the narrow gate are all the Christians on their way to heaven. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. That's the surface level, but there's a deeper meaning that Jesus has here. And in your notes, I've given you some reasons why this is not just about non-Christians and real Christians, and that the real Christians have gone through the narrow gate, and the wide gate is for the lost people. And here's why this is not true for that. This type of comparison, first of all, does not fit the context. Remember, Jesus is preaching to very religious Jewish people. They're doing everything they're supposed to do by the law, okay? They honor the Sabbath. They don't work. They do all these things that the law required, okay? So it doesn't fit the context. And for Jesus to take a left turn here at the end of the sermon just does not fit within the context. Here's a second reason. All the pairs Jesus puts together are very similar. Both sets of people are on a road. One's wide and one's narrow. You got two houses, they look identically the same, but they got different foundations. You got two pieces of fruit, they look identically the same, but they're not. You got Two groups that look like real sheep, but one of them is not. It, it's not that Jesus is talking about, when he talks about wolves that we read about, he's talking about a bunch of people who sit back and hiss at the name of Jesus or have their eyes rolled back during some worship service softly praying to Lord Baltimore, okay? And for those of you who are older, you don't know a clue who Lord Baltimore is, but this group over here does, all right? All right? Because we tend to base our faith on the outward appearance of things. And Jesus is talking about genuine conversion takes place inside. It's not something that's outward only. And what's frightening to me that on judgment day, these people who are not getting in think he is their Lord. They say to him, Lord, Lord. But they're not. In fact, both houses that we read have the same. They look identical. But what makes them different is the foundation that's different. So we're not to read this passage and think, well, oh, the wide gate, that's all the people this morning that got up and went off to the beach and went out in the sun. And those of us that went through the narrow gate, we got up, we took a shower, we got dressed, and we came to church this morning, and we're listening to Pastor Kelly. That's the easy way to look at this. That's the surface level. But there is a much deeper level that Jesus is addressing. He's talking strictly to religious people. He's not talking to non-religious people in this text. It's kind of like if you go down to Daytona Beach and you see a bunch of college kids on spring break and they're over here drinking, partying, sleeping around with everybody, but then there's this other college group that's come down to do a mission trip. And it's easy to say, well, the partying group, they're the group that went through the wide gate and this kids, the college kids are on a mission trip went through the narrow gate. No, Jesus is saying there are kids even in the mission trip group that have gone through the wide gate. 
not just the narrow gate. It's so easy for us to look at the external and size people up. I've been in the ministry most of my life, and I've seen all kinds of worship services where somebody says, well, when they come down, we'll just fill out, check this box. I received Jesus, now say this little sinner's prayer, and yada, 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 now let's get you baptized, and, and now you're saved. You got your free pass to heaven, and then they go off and live their life however they want to live. That's not what salvation is. Jesus says genuine salvation starts inside. That's where it starts. But we often fall in the danger of measuring others and even ourselves by the outward things we do for the kingdom of God and even for church. And these folks thought they had it made. They thought they'd done everything right. They've done all the religious rituals, abide by all the religious rules and regulations. But Jesus said one day those folks are going to look at him and he's going to say, depart from me. You're not mine. So let's look at these four pictures that Jesus gives. Because it gives us an indication of what makes the difference. Okay? Number one, there are many falsely assured Christians. There are many. As I told you, the word that Jesus used for many means, you, so many, you, you just there's not a number big enough for them hardly. You stop counting. And there are a lot of people who are in the church, or a lot of people who have been part of the church, who think they're saved and they can, they're on their way to heaven. And that, Jesus says, no, not necessarily. Look what he says, beginning in verse 13, the last part of it. He says, the way is easy that leads to destruction, talking about this wide gate. And those who enter it are many. The way is hard, meaning by the narrow gate that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now notice what he says. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Now realize, they acknowledge him as God. They acknowledge him as Lord. And they go, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Do me any mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. And according to Jesus, millions and millions of people who have been in church, been in church, that's what they're going to hear on Judgment Day. Depart from me. You're not mine. So there's a lot of falsely assured people in churches all across America who think they're genuinely saved, they think they're genuinely his, but they are not. Here's the second picture that Jesus gives to try to reinforce this. From the outside, false Christians, okay, can look very similar to real Christians. When you look from the outside, bless you, when you look from the outside, they look like the real thing. But on Judgment Day, Jesus knows the difference. Look at verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Notice what Jesus says here. From the outside, you got two groups. They both look like real sheep. One is real. The other one over here that looks like real sheep, they're not. But inside, they're ravenous wolves. They look like a real Christian. They talk like Christians. They do the Christian things. They get involved in Christian ministry. They go to church. By all outward appearances, they look like a genuine Christian. But in fact, what makes it even worse, that it gives them this false assurance is what they said they did for the kingdom of God. Look at this in verse 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? I mean, that's an impressive list. I've been in church my whole life. I have never in my life cast out a demon from anybody. Any of you? Any of you done a prophecy for God that came true? Mighty works means they were able to do miracles. Any of you ever done a miracle? I haven't. I mean, that's rather impressive to me. You see, one of the reasons this passage is so horrifying, so terrifying, is that these people genuinely did these things for the kingdom of God, and they think they're saved. They think they're on their way to heaven. But they're not. This passage scares me to death. And I hope it does you too. Because if it doesn't, I can assure you right now, you're not his. This is one of these passages that Jesus separates sheep from goats. These people refer to Jesus as Lord. The word that they use for Lord here is kyrios. It's, in the New Testament Greek word, it's always used as a reference to God. 
These people recognize Jesus as God. These are not people who are doing these unbelievable things for God due to some intellectual or moral code. They're not trying to be politically correct. They're not some random group of religious people. These are committed Orthodox Jewish people of Jesus' day who've done these things. Here's another thing I want you to see. In Greek, when a name is repeated twice, it's often a sign of affection and emotional connection. They say, Lord, Lord, they love Jesus. They are connected to Jesus. There are many passages in Scripture where a name is repeated. Here's just one from the book of Samuel. When David had lost his son Absalom, King David was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears, and he went in. He cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, if only I died instead of you. Anytime a name is repeated at least twice, it, it shows a sign of deep love, a deep connection, a deep affection. These people genuinely love God. So why are they not going to heaven? Look at verse 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? How's that possible? Well, in your notes, I've given you four examples from the Bible where other people did this. You remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and he threw his staff down and it became a snake? The scripture says the Egyptian magicians did the same thing. They threw theirs down, they became cobras or whatever, but, you know, Moses' snake ate theirs, all right? But they were able to take a staff, throw it down, and use magic or the occult to turn their staffs into snakes. There's a story in the Bible by Caiaphas, who was the high priest that led the campaign to crucify Jesus. In John 15, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and Jesus did. There's a story in the Bible, in the book of Acts, by, by a guy named, uh, he's a sorcerer named Simon the Sorcerer, and the Bible says he was able to do many miraculous things through his black magic and demonology and occultism. One of my favorites is in Numbers 22. Do you know the story of Balaam? Remember that story? God used his donkey and spoke literally to Balaam, and, and the donkey gave Balaam a mini-sermon. Now, how's that? What if you went home today, and if you own a dog, your dog walked in and says, well, what was the sermon like today? In other words, there are examples in Scripture where this is, all has occurred. So just because a miracle happened, just because it's in the name of God doesn't mean it's of God. Nowhere in Scripture does it say because of the prophecy of Caiaphas that Caiaphas was saved and he went to heaven. These people thought they were Christian. They were involved in ministry. They came to prayer meetings. They were involved in Bible study. They went on mission trips. By their outward behavior, their practices, their language, their rituals, these false Christians appeared indistinguishable from the true Christians. And that's the danger here that Jesus is saying. They look so real. And you can't tell from the outside whether they are or not, but they're not his. And Jesus, to reiterate this, says this in the beginning in verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And so when you look at the trees, the fruit looks the same. It's not that one tree has this luscious, wonderful fruit on it, and this tree over here has rotting, shriveled fruit. That's not what it means. From the outside, the fruit is the same. And to show you how this is true in Scripture, in verse 17, Jesus refers to one of the trees as being diseased. This is the Greek New Testament word, sapros. And it literally means poisonous. It does not mean shriveled. It does not mean rotting. It means the bad fruit is poisoned from the inside. Something has happened to it. it, it, it put, think of it this way. You're looking at two trees that both the fruit looks luscious, it looks wonderful. But this one over here, somebody's taken a syringe and put in that syringe deadly cobra venom and injected it into that apple, that pear, that orange, whatever it is. And then you go to pick it. You can't tell from the outside that that cobra venom's in it. That poison is in it. But it's there, and if you eat it, you will die. The same thing with the two houses. They look identical but they've just got different foundations. So Jesus is not talking about one guy who worships Jesus and one who sits at home and smokes dope and plays Kiss Records backwards. Or about a guy who loves his neighbor and another guy who curses at his neighbor. 
He's not talking about two fruits that look totally different. They look the same. And what is Jesus' point? It's this. It's only by looking on the inside that you can see they are different. Here's the third word picture Jesus gives. For these false Christians, they will be shocked to learn that they're not genuinely Christians. When you read what Jesus says to them, it comes as a complete shock to them. They thought they were in. They thought at Judgment Day they made it, but they didn't. So let's go back and look at how they felt this way. I want to read to you again verse 22. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then they will, then I will declare to them, depart from me, I never knew you. What I want you to notice in this passage, Jesus never says they didn't do these things. He never says, oh no, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I, no, you're lying. He doesn't say that to them. In fact, he acknowledges that they did these things. And these false Christians go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I was a member of Southside Baptist Church. I went on mission trips. I was in a small group. I was in a Sunday school class. I got baptized. I filled in blanks from Pastor Kelly's sermon. I've got more sermons from him. I have a commentary. I've been on mission trips for Southside. I did all these Christian things. I did the rituals. In fact, uh, I've got a certificate from taking the, the, the new members class, and I got a baptism certificate that basically says, I'm in the kingdom of God. What do you mean I'm not in? And that's Jesus' point. We're so easy to look at the outward, what we do, that it can deceive us of what's really on the inside. And it is a danger, it is a cancer that is infecting the church today. Here's the fourth picture that Jesus gives. Jesus tells us how to know if we're a false Christian. As I've shown you, the difference is not in the observance of religious rituals. It's not in the fervency of your religious devotion. It's not just going to church every week. It's not being part of a Bible study or a prayer meeting. It's not knowing the Roman road, if you don't know what I mean by that. It's a verses you pull out of the book of Roman to lead people to Jesus Christ. It's not about even moral behavior. In fact, the Pharisees, they were on the varsity team for doing all this. In fact, most Pharisees had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. They did it all, but they're not in. So why are there false Christians? Here's reason number one. They have no personal relationship to Jesus Christ. They have no firsthand knowledge of Jesus Christ. The word that's translated in verse 20 Three, where Jesus says, I never knew you. The word know or knew means intimate, personal, developing relationship love. They don't have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. They knew who Jesus was. They just don't know who Jesus. They thought they did. There was a, never a surrender to or love for Jesus for the sake of Jesus himself. They served God, but it was never out of love for him. It was because they wanted something from him. They'd done the rituals, and they thought that was enough. That satisfies him. They thought if I go through all the religious rituals, I get involved in ministry, I go to church, I do all these things that I'm supposed to do, that proves I'm in. Jesus said, that's not what proves you're in. Okay? So they, it wasn't that they had this certain code or conduct only. They thought by doing all of these things assured them that they were in. What they had was knowledge of Jesus. They just didn't have Jesus. It's kind of like marriage. Audrey sitting right over here, my wife. Let's say that I say to her this afternoon, Audrey, what I really need from you are kids, a clean house. What, what do I need to do for you to guarantee me that? How about, Audrey, we just have a clean house every night when I come home. What do I need to do? What if she said, well, I need, I need you to be home every night by 6. I need $300 a week just going on a shopping spree. I don't want you watching any sports. I want you home every Saturday. I want an occasional set of flowers and perfume. And I do all those things. Would you call that a marriage? No. Some of you are going, I wish my spouse did that. <laughs> but that's not a marriage. You see, serving God 
because he's a means to a better life or a way to escape hell is not the Christian faith. And that's Jesus' point. We think if we do certain things, that assures me that I'm in. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. Even lost people can do the right thing, and they're not getting in. Here's a second reason why there are false Christians. They had a compartmentalized lordship of Jesus. They, they put Jesus in some areas of their life, but not all areas of their life. That's what I mean by compartmentalize. Jesus says to them, you workers of lawlessness. And anytime the word lawlessness is used in the New Testament, it's a reference to those who have do some of the things that Jesus wants, but they've not made him Lord over all areas of their life. Maybe they give him five-tenths or six-tenths or eight-tenths, but they haven't given him every area of their life, okay? I mean, if I te- let's say I own a very successful business. I mean, it's very successful, and I, and I, I hire you, and I say, look, I, I want you to run my business for me. Okay? But I want you to know that I reserve the right to veto or override any decision you make. Who's still ultimately in control of the business? Me. That's these people. Uh, let's, let's go back to the marriage analogy. What if I said to Audrey, Audrey, there's 168 hours a week. There's 160 hours in each week. I want to be married to you for 166 of those, but two hours every Saturday night, I want to go out and party like a single guy. Is that marriage? No. Here's Jesus' point, and this is what I really want to sink into you. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. That's his point. And many people who claim to be Christ followers compartmentalize their relationship with Christ. And if he's not Lord over your money, your time, your talents, your skills, your abilities, your attitude, your language, your hobbies, your career, your marriage, if he's not Lord over all, Jesus says, I'm not Lord at all. And if you can't say that Jesus has final say in every area of your life, you don't know him as Lord. And that's Jesus' point here. And this is why this text is so frightening. I mean, there are even churches today that try to split this up. They say, well, you come and let's first talk about you making him your Savior. Uh, just say this little simple prayer and then check this box. You ask Jesus in your life and then get baptized and you're kind of free to go do what you want to do. And it's our goal that eventually down the road, maybe you will want to bring more of your life under the Lordship of Christ and get one of our discipleship programs and we'll be happy if you do that. But if you don't, you're still going to heaven. Jesus says, oh, no, 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 that's not how this works. And this is the problem I have with a lot of mega churches today. Their pastors preach a watered-down version of the gospel to attract so many people. They, they bring them in by this wide gate rather than the narrow gate. And they say, just say this sinner's prayer, check this box, get baptized, and you're free to live your life however you want to live it. We hope, you know, you'll eventually come under the Lordship of Christ. And you look at mega churches, they look awesome, they look very successful, they look very blessed. Okay, they got huge numbers, multiple campuses. But I know a lot of people go to these mega churches. And many of them serve as volunteers in these churches. And they'll talk to me about God and Jesus, da 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 da. Then I go check their social media post. And on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, they got some of the most vulgar, filthy, obscene stuff that would make you throw up. They think it's funny. They think it's wonderful. They joke about it. They laugh about it. They say, look at this funny thing I found. And it's got the F word, the GD, word, all this stuff. Jesus says, that's not my child. This is why this passage is so terrifying. It's why it's so horrifying. Now, I want you to read my lips. I want Southside to grow and grow and grow, but never Never at the expense of watering down the truth of God's gospel. I will never do that. I, will, I never want anyone to look at me in heaven on judgment day and say, you told me I would be here. Why am I not here? I will teach you the truth. I will preach you the truth. I will never condemn you. I will never judge you. But I want you to know there is a difference a huge difference, and this is why this passage is so horrifying. 
I want Southside to be a place where visitors can come, seekers can come, and ask genuine questions about the Bible and about faith and why we believe what we believe. I want that. And I want them to be able to do that without fear or reservation. But I will never soft play the truth of the gospel. And that means if you tell me that Jesus is Lord of your life, then make him Lord of every area of your life. Stop compartmentalizing your life. Stop saying this is my work life or this is my social life, this is my recreation life, this is my marriage life, this is my parent life, or this is my social life, this is my hobby life. And in some of those areas, he's not Lord. Jesus makes it very clear with no ifs, ands, buts about it. If he's not Lord of all, he's not your Lord. And I can't say it any plainer. Now I know what some of you are thinking. I don't want you to misunderstand me here. Jesus is not asking us to live perfect lives or sinless lives. He knows we can't do that. <laughs> if that was the case, we're all cooked. That drill is all out. We're all messed up. We all got issues. We all got failures and shortcomings and sins. I'm still battling issues. I've battled for years, and you do too. What I'm saying is that if you have, you have to acknowledge Jesus' claim over your life, it has to be total. There's no portion of your life that is off limits. Sure, you're messed up and you need lots of work, but you recognize his lordship is total and you're looking to him to bring all areas of your life under his control. That's what I'm talking about. Some of you may be thinking, well, sounds like you're saying we don't, if we don't have obedient lives where we obey his commands, we don't go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you have to say, Jesus, these are the areas I struggle with. These are the areas where I sin. These are the areas where I mess. I want your lordship in these areas too. And I give you permission to correct me, to discipline me, to do whatever it takes to bring that area of my life under your lordship. That's what I'm talking about. Faith that doesn't produce improving obedience. By improving obedience, I mean a determination that you're bringing every area of your life under the lordship of Christ Every area of your life, not some, but all areas of your life, especially the areas where you sin, especially the areas where you have weaknesses, especially the areas where you mess up. Stop making excuses. Stop rationalizing it. Stop justifying it. Bring it all under his lordship. That means your money, your time, your talents, your language, your hobbies, whatever it is for you, bring it all under his lordship. Stop saying, well, that's just the way I am, warts and all. It's not going to fare with him in heaven. In other words, you are saved by faith, but, you're, but that faith should be producing good works that you see that his lordship is coming into every area of your life. It's kind of like people have said to me, you mean I should come to Jesus as a child? Yes. You, we come to him with a childlike faith. We accept him for who he is. It's kind of like if you've ever stood on the side of a pool with your little children, and you say, jump into daddy's arms. And they're doing this. Come on, come on. Daddy's not going to drop you. Come on, come on. Do you believe daddy loves you? Mm -hmm. Do you believe daddy catch you? No. And then finally the kid jumps. And there's that moment they're jumping going, I hope he catches me. But you have to be willing to jump, to surrender into totalness, total surrender and total abandonment. And that's what Jesus says. If he's your Lord, he's Lord over all. And all of us have areas in our life that we excuse. We make light of. We don't call it sin. We don't change in that area. And Jesus says, if I'm not Lord over those areas, I'm not Lord at all in your life. All of us, I think, want God's love. We want the comfort of Christ. We want to be part of knowing the joy of being part of a fellowship of believers. We want to be part of a group that does wonderful things for the kingdom of God in our communities. The question is, are you willing to lay down at his feet all areas? Every area. Have you ever been around someone who's very generous, but they're generous on their own terms? That's the way it is here. I, they still want to be able to decide what they do with their own money. Even in their generosity, Jesus says, that's not the way it works with me. 
if I'm going to be your Lord, I've got to be Lord over every area of your life, all areas. There has to be this passion with you, this desire in you to bring every area of your life under my lordship. You've got to be willing to give up control. Let me override. Let me veto if necessary. Let me correct. Listen, the choice that Jesus gives here is this. You must choose to abandon your self-will or you must choose to abandon your hope to heaven. That's the choice. There's no middle ground here with Jesus. Here's a third reason why there were false Christians. Though outwardly religious, they are inwardly ravenous. So when you look at them, you'll say, oh, that's a religious person. They go to church, they read the Bible, they're part of a small group, they sing, they're on the praise team, or they're a deacon, or whatever, they teach Sunday school, whatever, they run the lights and sound and media force, whatever. Whatever you look at people and say, oh, they're a good person, they're a religious person, they're a godly person, they're a Christian. Verse 15, Jesus says, beware of those who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So there's these other two groups, genuine sheep, and this group over here that looks like genuine sheep, but they're ravenous wolves. And the Greek New Testament word that Jesus uses here for ravenous is harpox. This word was used to describe starving wolves who, when catching their prey, would rip it into shreds. This word was also used in Jesus' day as a metaphor to refer to swindlers, someone who deceitfully and unmercifully extorts a person of their money, their possessions, or anything else. It was a word that was used to refer to someone who was empty and was trying to fill themselves up with something else. These are people who are doing religious things, but it's for the purpose of gaining something, and that's Jesus' point. They're, they're doing these things to gain something, okay? For some, it's the praise of others. You serve in the church, you do things here, and somebody comes and says, good job, I liked what you did, and you just, you eat it up. Not because... You're really doing it for the right reason. You see, pride kicks in. You, you, you want people to acknowledge you. You want people to say things about you. Some people do things because they want to be accepted by others. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about a lot of religion that is for the praise of men. In fact, much of the Sermon on the Mount is about us avoiding the praise of others. But you can do good works out of pride. Because you, you expect something to be done. You try to gain something from God. Not because you really want to know God, but you, you, you want God to do something for you. And, and when life doesn't go your way, you sit there and you go, wait a minute, God, I've done this and this and this and this is the thanks you give me? And Jesus' point is that even these very religious people, many of them were doing all the right things for all the wrong reason. They didn't care about, desire, or genuinely love God. They didn't seek him. They weren't trying to grow closer to him. And in verse 15, there are people who are outwardly religious, but they were inwardly ravenous. They were just doing these things for something they could get. Here's a fourth reason, a fourth way you can tell who's a false Christian. Because they have no rock-solid foundation, their commitment to Christ falters in the storms of life. Jesus talks about two houses, one built on a foundation of rock, another built on the foundation of sand. And look what he says in verse 27. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall, meaning the house built on sand. Life goes wrong for you. You get that bad medical report, or that spouse walks out on you, or you lose your job, and you stop and you think, God, how could you do this to me? Well, if God, if that's the way you're going to treat me, then I'm done with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to. You see, a lot of people base their relationship to Christ on a contract. God, you say if I do X, Y, and Z, then you will do this for me. It's a tit for tat. God says, that's not what I've ever done. I've already done the one thing you need, saved you or offered you salvation. I don't need to do anything else for you. And a lot of people treat God that way, that he owes them something. God, I'm going to do this and this and this for you. And then I expect you to make my life easier. I expect my kids to grow up and honor you and love you and have happy marriages and all these things. But then the storm comes and we get mad at God. We blame God. Well, God, what good is it? I've done all these things. What good are you? And you leave him. I mean, all of us know people have been very involved in church and they're not here today. Why? Because someone said something to them because they had such little tiny feelings I'm sorry, I'm tired of hearing, they hurt my feelings. Grow up. If that is as big as your Jesus is, he's not your Lord. You know what they said against our Lord? Did he stop and say, 
Father God, I can't handle this anymore. No. He fell on his knees and he prayed for those very people. That's how you know you're his. And Jesus says there's a big difference in having the outward appearance versus what's inward. And for some people in the church and some of you, in, there's a poison in your heart. But outwardly, we look at you, oh, great church person, great South Sider. You can tell they, they know the Lord. Not necessarily, Jesus says. You see, a real Christian has a foundation that carries him or her through any storm. Your faith in God, in Christ, is not based on God policing your circumstances, but on the person of Christ. We all want a God who protects us. He already has. He's protected us from the worst thing possible, hell. Jesus says, he wants you to be able to say like Job. You know Job God allowed God, God allowed Satan to take everything from Job. Job goes through everything. He loses everything. He's one of the most wealthiest men in the Bible, loses all his kids, I mean, all this stuff. And now, after all this is said and done, look what Job says. Even if God killed me, my hope and trust will always be in him. That's how you know you're his. The storms of life don't cause you to falter. When life doesn't go the way you expect, you don't give up on God. Because you, your relationship to him is not based on your circumstances. It's based on who Jesus Christ is. It's kind of like with our daughter, Emmy, sitting over here. We, for those of you visiting, we adopted her in 2015. We brought her home from Bulgaria. She didn't speak a word of English, none. Okay? And it's funny to go back and when Audrey took maternity leave and was teaching her English and to watch her first videos where she's learning to speak English. And she has that little Bulgarian accent. She doesn't have it now. She even says, y'all, like a southern person. Okay, she's got this down, okay? Now, here's the point. The papers, the legal papers that said she was our daughter says, I'm her daddy. When she came home, she didn't see me as her daddy. She didn't see Audrey as her mommy. The papers said we were, but it wasn't in her heart yet. In fact, we asked her, when she got English down really well, what did you think when we brought you home? You know what she said? She said, I thought you were going to kill me. You know what you said? Okay. Nod yes. I'm on. Okay. Nod yes. The paper said, Archibald Kelly Stanley Jr. is that girl's daddy. But it wasn't in her heart yet. It has taken time and nurturing and loving and being there with her. Now, when she says daddy, she means it. See, there's a difference. There's a difference in saying, I'm a Christ follower and being a Christ follower. There's a huge difference. And that's what Jesus is driving home to us today. No paper can put in her heart that I'm her daddy. Furthermore, when the storms are threatening to sweep away everything else, you know without a shadow of a doubt, like Job, if you lose everything. I mean, you lose your house, you lose your money, you lose your career, you lose your health like Job did. You lose it all. You lose everything. You still have this confidence, I haven't lost the one thing that matters, my relationship to Jesus Christ. See, one of the biggest signs that you're not really a Christian is that your commitment to Christ goes up and down depending on your circumstances. Your religious foundation is built not on God, knowing God personally is built on knowing things about God. And there's a big difference in knowing about God and knowing God. Years and years ago, when we were living in Kentucky, a friend of mine uh, had lost his job as an engineer, and he got a job driving limos. And he called me one day. I've told you some of this. And he called me one day, and he says, hey, how would you? Um, he says, you're a big Trekkie, aren't you? Yeah, I love Star Trek. Always have. He said, um, well, i got to pick up somebody in Louisville. They're flying in Louisville, and I'm taking this person to Lexington, Kentucky, because he owns a big horse farm there. How would you like to ride for an hour and a half in the back of the limo with William Shatner? I said, Captain Kirk? Really? So I spent an hour and a half in a limo with Captain Kirk, William Shatner, okay? He was very personable, very engaging, very warm. I mean, we, I mean you thought we were good friends the way we talked. Then he got out, and he left. Now listen, I still don't know William Shatner. I know things about William Shatner. There is a big difference. And my concern for the modern church today, we have led people to think 
they say a certain prayer, they check a certain box, they get baptized, they're in. And maybe you've prayed the sinner's prayer multiple times. Maybe Billy Graham signed your Bible. Maybe you've been baptized 10 times. That doesn't mean you're in the kingdom of God. And there's going to come a day when you're going to hear Jesus say, depart from me, you're not mine. There was a medical study done about people who have open heart surgery. In fact, 600,000 people a year have heart bypass surgery in America. That's just in America, 600,000 a year. These people are told that after their bypasses that they must change their lifestyle. They got to change how they eat. They got to get exercise, got to get sleep. They got to do all these changes. They got to quit smoking. They got to quit drinking. In essence, the doctor says, you either change or you're going to die. And you would think that if you've come that close to your near-death experience, you would think if now you know what to do to correct this from happening again, you would think that the evidence is so compelling that you would make a change. And here's what they've discovered. Two years later, 90% of all patients have had open heart bypass surgery have not changed a thing. 90% of them. In other words, they have chosen to die. You see, just knowing about the truth is different than knowing the truth. In fact, in 2013, at a public zoo in the third largest province in China, had temporarily shut down due to an unusual problem they were having. Visitors discovered that the zoo's lion was actually a dog posing as a lion. According to a report in the Beijing newspaper, the fraud came to light when a mother and her young son visited the zoo and the animal labeled African lion started barking. The, the employees of the zoo had dressed him up to look like a lion. And he was this large Tibetan Mastiff, one of the largest dogs on the planet. They put a man, I mean, he looked like a lion. And all of a sudden he stands up and starts going, woof, woof. And they're going, that, that's not a lion. They went on to discover other things that had been mislabeled. There was a white fox in a leopard's den, another dog being passed off as a wolf. Staff had wrapped two snakes at the reptile house to, they had wrapped two sea, uh, sea cucumbers that looked like two big anacondas in the snake exhibition. And here, when asked, here's what the employees said. We're doing our best to make this look real. What are you doing to make everyone think you are a real, genuine Christian? The warning Jesus gives here, if you're basing it on what we see externally, that probably means you're not his. It's not what's outside he bases us on. It's what's inside. And my fear is I don't want any of you one day to hear from Jesus, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, in our passage today, as I finish up, Jesus gives everyone the same choice. And it's up to you to decide what you will do with this question. I must choose what? That's the question. I must choose what? You mean I've got to make him Lord over every area of my life? Yes. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And that's the decision you have to make. And that's the decision everybody has to make. Because all of us are going to find ourselves in these unexpected places by an unexpected Jesus who puts us in a point to make a choice. Let's pray.